Hello, I am Professor Dr. Sanjay Joshi. Today I am going to have my presentation on hypertension in children. Hypertension all over the world is one of the commonest disease in adult and around one third of the adult population is affected by this disorder. Interestingly, hypertension is not uncommon in children. There are various studies like Bacalu study, Houston study or CMC Wellow study which suggest that the incidence of hypertension in children is around 2 to 4 percent. Just to give you a few examples, this was 9 year old Rakesh, son of a doctor, was brought in status epilepticus was admitted in PISU and treated and his evaluation revealed that he had hypertension encephalopathy and uh, the blood pressure was 180 by 120. Surprisingly, his blood pressure was never recorded since his birth. This is 13 days old child was brought with complaints of not accepting feeds, seizures and congestive cardiac failure. His blood pressure was 110 by 72 and clinical examination revealed that his hypertension was due to co-optation of aorta. This is Master Budhiya Singh, world's youngest marathon runner. Interestingly, his blood pressure was not detected uh, that he was hypertensive till he completed his marathon. So the bottom line is hypertension is undiagnosed in children. So the fourth report of National High Blood Pressure Evaluation recommends that all children 3 years and above must have a blood pressure recording done at least once a year. BP should be recorded in a quiet environment with correct cuff size and fifth correct cuff sound as the diastolic blood pressure. BP more than 95th percentile should be investigated. BP should be also measured regularly in high risk children. The cuff should encircle around 80 to 100 percent of the arm and the bladder length should be more than 40 percent of the arm circumference because small cuff give erroneously high readings and large cuff give low readings. It has been found that hypertension in children is the root of essential hypertension in adult. Children with blood pressure more than 90th percentile have three-fold higher risk of having hypertension in adult. Conversely, half of the hypertensive adult had blood pressure more than 90th percentile as the children. Effective treatment of childhood hypertension may decrease the risk of coronary heart disease, renal disease and stroke in adult life. The concept of tracking of blood pressure is a process by which the child maintains his relative ranking of blood pressure in the same percentile as he grows. For example, a 5 year old child who has blood pressure more than 95th percentile has 3 times more chance of having the same blood pressure that is 95th percentile at the age of even 15 years and 25 years. There are various ways of recording the blood pressure, right, direct or invasive method wherein an intraarterial catheter has been put and it is connected to the monitor and we get various readings on the monitor. Other methods are oscillometric devices, then digital, then NIBP and multiple monitors uh, and some newer, new techniques like finger plethysmography and ABPM. ABPM that is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. The concept is that that blood pressure varies widely throughout the day in context of diurnal variation, uh, physical activity, then emotional stress and sleep etc. So one single reading of blood pressure cannot uh, label a person like hypertension and therefore one should have a 24 hours record of blood pressure and for that purpose, for that purpose a small cuff has been tied on the arm of the uh, and the recorder is tied to the belt and the device is set to monitor the blood pressure every 15 to 20, 30 minutes continuously for next 24 hours and the child continues his daily activity the sleep the study etc and then the data of that 24 hours is fed to the computer and after that we get various readings the first is the mean blood pressure so we get values obtained for awake and sleep period separately which gives us a trend of blood pressure rather than one single reading Second thing we get is BP load. It is the percentage of BP reading exceeding 95th percentile of the normal, which is better measure of the hemodynamic stress. Then there is a concept called a sleep decline. Normal nocturnal sleep dipping is around 10% of the awake BP. It is lost in hypertensive organ injury, end stage renal disease and insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. There are, these results cannot be compared with the normative distributed charts. This is the disadvantage. 
but the remember the most important uh, method of recording the blood pressure is our gold standard mercury method now we define the hypertension as opposed to that of an adult where we have some figures like systolic of 120 and diastolic of 80 as opposed to this definition of an adult hypertension is in, in children is influenced by sex of the child age of the child and height of the child so we take the blood pressure reading of a child and then these readings are plotted on the normative distributive charts and tables which are available like this and if these reading are below the 95th, 90th percentile for that particular age, gender and height, then it is considered to be normal blood pressure for that child. If the readings are between 99, 90th to 95th percentile, then the, it is called a pre-hypertension or elevated BP. If the reading is between 95th to 99th percentile plus 5 millimeters, then it is called as stage 1 hypertension. If the reading is, between, uh, uh, is more than 99th percentile plus 5 millimeters, then it is called as stage 2 hypertension. And the concept is the white coat hypertension, where if you take the record the blood pressure of a child in a hospital setup, then uh, the blood pressure is more than 95th percentile. But if the uh, blood pressure is recorded in a domestic atmosphere outside the hospital, then it is normal. This is called as white coat hypertension. BP has to be recorded on at least three occasions. So to summarize, uh, at birth, the child's blood, blood pressure, who is of more than 3 kg, is approximately 65 by 45. At one year, it is around 75 by 50. At three years, it is 84 by 60. At eight years, it is 95 by 65. And 10 years, it is 105 by 70, plus minus 5 millimeters mercury. But many times, these normative distributive charts are not available, and therefore, a crude formula is given which says that if the blood pressure of the child at one year of age is around 75 by 50 then the systolic blood pressure increases with a formula of 75 plus 3a where a equal to a is equal to age and the diastolic, uh, diastolic blood pressure increases with a formula of 45 plus 2a where a equal to age but this formula is useful only up to 10 years of age and it's a crude formula remember what are the different risk factors? The most important one is a genetic factor because 70% of the hypertension runs in families. Other risk factor includes obesity and overweight. Then a syndrome called as metabolic syndrome, which is characterized by microalbuminuria, then visceral obesity, hyperinsulinemia is associated with hypertension. Then other risk factors include a small for gestational age baby, or children with history of recurrent urinary tract infection or renal scarring or children with sleep disorders or history of umbilical artery catheterization at birth. Smoking, especially in adolescent and alcohol consumption, increase the risk of hypertension in children. We classify hypertension into three groups. One, a primary or essential hypertension where hypertension is without any underlying cause. Second, secondary hypertension where hypertension is associated with some underlying cause and neonatal hypertension. The main chunk of causes of secondary hypertension is the renal disorders, which accounts for approximately 70% of the cases. Amongst them, renal parenchymal disorders, which uh, causes around 90% of the cases, which uh, includes glomerulonephritis, acute or chronic, or acute or chronic pyelonephritis, acute tabular necrosis, hanoxian lymph purpura, neoplasms, obstructive uropathy, hemolytic uremic syndrome, collagen vascular disorders, and then some renovascular disorders like renal artery disorders or renal vein thrombosis. The second group is a cardiovascular disorder which includes coarctation of aorta and then vasculitis, rectaicaviceous arteritis or large stroke volume syndromes like PDA, aortic insufficiency. Then endocrine disorders like hyperthyroidism or excessive catecholamine producing tumors like pheochromocytoma or neuroblastoma or adrenal dysfunction due to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome or hyperparathyroidism. Then the neurological condition include infective polyneuritis or condition which increase the uh, intracranial pressure due to tumors, infection, trauma and hemorrhage. There are some drugs like steroids, amphetamine and sympathomimetic drugs which leads to hypertension. And there are some miscellaneous conditions like hypernatremia, Steven Johnson syndrome, fracture of the long bones, burns which causes hypertension. Hypertension can also be classified into transient hypertension and sustained hypertension. 
the transient hypertension uh, the causes are post septal neural nephritis hanoxial and purpura hemolytic uremic syndrome raised intracranial pressure drug induced or glenbarre syndrome a burns and sustained hypertension may be due to coarctation of aorta renovascular causes in chronic nephritis essential hypertension some endocrine causes clinically a child with hypertension can present in six different ways a young infant can present with distress congestive heart failure seizures irritability vomiting and tachycardia but the commonest presentation of hypertension in children is that they remain silent they are usually asymptomatic and they are detected during routine school examination or school camps some children present with headache epistaxis vomiting blurring of vision abnormal behavior some children present with life threatening complications like encephalopathy renal failure or pulmonary edema acute heart failure dissecting aneurysm stroke or focal neurological deficit some children present with secondary those with secondary hypertension present with clinical features of underlying disease for example there is a child with acute glomerulonephritis with hypertension then the child will have the clinical manifestations of underlying disorder that is acute glomerulonephritis and lastly children may present with end organ disorders like um, heart uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or uh, progressive renal failure or retinal damage so these are the different clinical manifestations of a children with hypertension hypertension can cause various complications they can be classified into acute complications and chronic complications the acute complications are again classified into emergencies and urgencies there is a small difference between the two if the rise uh, rise in the blood pressure is associated with acute end organ failure like encephalopathy or intracranial bleed or acute left ventricular failure then it is called as emergency and if the bp is risen to high levels without evidence of acute organ end organ damage then it is called as urgency there are various chronic complications of hypertension like retinopathy concentric left ventricular hypertrophy diastolic dysfunction and chronic renal failure etc now how do we approach to a child with hypertension we approach with four main aim first to classify whether it was a primary hypertension or secondary hypertension second to find out the associated comorbidities third to find out the stage of end organ uh, failure and lastly to decide the line of treatment and for this we have we take a detailed history the um, uh, the first point in history is the age of the child age of the child is directly proportional to primary hypertension the lesser the age that is younger the child less is the incidence of primary hypertension as the age of the child increases the chances of primary hypertension increases similarly the chance of secondary hypertension is very high if the child as the age of the child is low and the chances of secondary hypertension goes down as the child's age increases then we also take the history whether the child was born as a small for gestational age was there any history of umbilical artery catheterization Uh, 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 complaints like palpitation, headache, sweating, which are suggestive of coarctation of aorta, or renal complaints like urinary tract infection, or renal trauma, or renal surgery, or hematuria. Then history of any medication like steroids or oral contraceptive pills, especially in adolescent girls. And then uh, habits like smoking, alcohol, and very important is family history of essential hypertension. there are some various clinical signs which gives us clue to prob probable etiology suppose the child has tachycardia then there is the, there is a possibility of hyperthyroidism the child has retinal damage then we uh, think of whether uh, suffering the child is suffering from severe hypertension when the child is having growth retardation then we suspect chronic renal failure then if, uh, if there are acne is hirsutism then we suspect cushing syndrome if there are murmurs left ventricular hypertrophy or congestive cardiac failure then we suspect coarctation of aorta if there is adenoma sebaceum and then uh, cafeolar spots then we suspect tuberous sclerosis so there are various clinical findings clinical signs which tells us something about the possible etiology of hypertension like for the suppose this is a 6 year old child who presented with puffiness of face edema on feet and then abdominal wall edema and a classical collocular urine and the diagnosis was acute glomerulonephritis and the child had hypertension this is another child who with nephrotic syndrome and was taking long term steroids and had hypertension 
this is child who presented with small um, swelling in the neck and exophthalmos the child had hyperthyroidism and hypertension this is a child with congenital congenital lateral hyperplasia ambiguous genitalia and the child's blood pressure was raised. this is a child with tuberous sclerosis who had chagrin patch adenoma sebaceum ashleaf macules and the blood pressure was on higher side this is a child with chronic renal failure you can see the stunted growth of the child and the child's blood pressure was very high this child presented with a lump in abdomen with hypertension and the lump ultimately turned to turn out to be wilms tumor this child had steven johnson syndrome following some drug ingestion and the blood pressure was high so these are the various clinical signs which we see and we can have some clinical clues about the diagnosis now we come to the management management includes investigations and treatment there are three levels of investigation level 1 level 2 and level 3 level 1 investigations are like cbc serum electrolytes uric acid renal function test or liver function test lipid profile or abdominal sonography level 2 investigations include intravenous urography or micturating cystourethrography or dtpa scan or vma levels usually these things are done to find out some underlying cause of a secondary hypertension like suppose thyroid profile is done to rule out hyperthyroidism then plasma renin activity digital subtraction angiography to rule out a coarctation of aorta or renal doppler or aortogram and then level 3 investigations include fundoscopy or echocardiography or technician 99 dms scan to find out renal scarring This is just to show you a grade four changes in the hypertensive retinopathy. The child had flame hemorrhages, papilledema, high uh, heart exudates, and cotton wool spots. They are suggestive of grade four hypertensive retinopathy. So, in short, the clinical approach, the algorithm to the clinical approach to a child with hypertension is that you record the blood pressure in all extremities and do a thorough clinical examination. if the gradient is present that means if we know that the blood pressure in lower extremity is higher in than upper extremity in children and if on the contrary if the blood pressure in upper extremity is higher and the lower extremity blood pressure is lower then we can suspect that there is a coarctation of aorta do we do a clinical thorough clinical examination and find out if there is any cause for secondary hypertension and if the gradient is absent then we do a urine examination if the urine examination is normal then we subject the child for renal color doppler if the renal color doppler is normal then it could be either an essential hypertension or an endocrine cause and we do some hormonal assays now if the renal color doppler shows some renovascular anomaly then there are, it could be a renal artery stenosis or renal vein thrombosis and that can be diagnosed called as per the renal color doppler now if the urine examination is abnormal and it shows predominantly rbcs then it could be tumors nephritis hanoxian lin purpura stones or nephrocalcinosis and they can be differentiated by ultrasonography if the uh, urine examination shows predominantly wbcs then uh, uh, uhg abdomen can be done and if it is normal then it, we are dealing with mostly a reflux nephritis or recurrent urinary tract infection and if the uhg shows in the anomaly then it could be hydronephrosis it could be polycystic kidney or it could be uh, uh, with some other infection how do we treat hypertension we have three aims or three goals in treating a child with hypertension <clears throat> first is to decrease the blood pressure below 95th percentile second to prevent the development of end organ damage and third to decrease the chance of not only short term but also long term morbidity such as stroke and coronary heart disease the treatment is classified into non pharmacological and pharmacological ways for non pharmacological we select there are four criteria for selection of the patient one the children having essential hypertension one second there is no end organ damage third children below the stage of uh, stage 2 hypertension and children without history of organ threatening complication so these are the four criteria for selection of patient for non pharmacological management and it includes american heart association recommendation that the dietary modification and weight reduction the uh, it should be a low sodium intake the salt should be restricted to 1 to 2 grams and no added salt should be uh, salt should be given in addition to that high intake of vegetables fruits and fibers and avoid in junk food. A regular isotonic exercises must be advised to the children 
Uh, sedentary activity uh, should be avoided and the screen time must be reduced. Nowadays, most of the children are uh, seeing uh, tabs and um, mobiles and etc. So, screen time should be reduced. There is a lot of role of yoga and meditation. So, it should be advised to the children and parents should be counseled regarding uh, avoiding avoidance of um, drinks, drugs and smoking. And the problem of hypertension should be discussed with the parents to solve the behavioral and psychological problems of the child. If the child doesn't respond to non-pharmacological treatment or if the child has symptomatic hypertension or the child has secondary hypertension or hypertension with end organ damage or there is a family history of hypertension with early complications or there is an associated type 1 or type 2 diabetes or there is, there is some children having dyslipidemia then these children are subjected for pharmacological treatment. Antihypertensive drugs can be classified into six groups. One is diuretics like thiazides, furosemides, paranolactone and triamterine. And then second group is an AC inhibitors like captopril, enalapril, lesinopril. Third group is the sympathetic drugs which includes beta blockers like propranolol, atenolol, metoprolol or alpha blockers like prazosine or mix uh, like lavetolol and then centrally acting drugs like methyldopam or clonidine. Then fourth group is angiotensin receptor blocker agents like losartan. F fifth group is calcium channel blockers like nifedipine and amlodipine. And then sixth group is vasodilators like hydralazine, minoxidil, and nitroprusside. And this slide shows us the various doses of various drugs of, and the antihypertensive drugs which we can see in any of the books. Uh, the step care approach is the very important thing that if suppose we diagnose the child with hypertension and then subject the child for dietary modification and non-pharmacological measures. If the child responds to these measures then, and there is a good control then we continue monitoring and ensure compliance. But if suppose the child is not responding then we usually start with one single drug. So either we add diuretic or beta blockers or AC inhibitors or calcium channel blockers. The principle is that we start with minimal dose and increase to maximum dose. With maximum dose, if the child has got good control, then again we ensure the compliance. But in spite of maximum dose, if the child is still not getting control, then we add a second drug. So we, in addition to diuretic, we add beta blockers or for we, in addition to that, we add either uh, calcium channel blockers or AC inhibitors. Now with these two drugs, again we start with minimum doses, increase to maximum dose. If in spite of that the child is still not responding, then we add the third third drug that is hydralazine or prazosin or uh, and reinvestigate the child. There are some specific recommendations. If the child has got essential hypertension, then the choice is between calcium channel blockers and AC inhibitors. If the child has got acute glomerular nephritis, then usually a calcium channel blocker or a loop diuretic. In cases of chronic kidney diseases, uh, the, either AC inhibitors or diuretics or rarely prazosin can be given. And children with renovascular hypertension, calcium channel blockers or beta blockers are given. Now we treat the hypertensive emergency. The basic principle of treating hypertensive emergency is that the BP should be lowered by 25% in first, 20, uh, first 8 hours and giving IV agents and followed by gradual reduction of BP over next 24 to 40 hours, 48 hours. Because attempt to lower blood pressure rapidly can damage the end organ and can cause ischemic damage to brain, retina or kidney. And therefore the principle is the blood pressure should be lowered gradually 25% in first 8 hours. Various drugs have been used like IV nitroprusside, IV lavetolol, IV nicotinamide, hydralazine and nitroglycerin drip, but the drug of choice is IV lavetolol. Diuretics should be used cautiously. Many people use sublingual nifedipine, but it is very dangerous, so it should be used very cautiously. Seizures can be controlled with lorazepam or medazolam. The volume status should be monitored. And once the crisis is over, the child is settled down, then the child can be shifted to over. Surgically curable hypertension may be due to there are various causes like unilateral kidney diseases, Wilms tumor, hydronephrosis, hypoplastic kidneys, or coarctation of aorta, pheochromocytoma. So these are the conditions in which a surgery cures hypertension. Just few words about neonatal hypertension. The prevalence is as high as 2.5%. If the blood pressure in a neonate, a full-term neonate is more than 90 by 60 or in a preterm it is more than 80 by 50, 
then it is called as hypertension in new, uh, neonatal age group two third of the infants the cause of hypertension is mostly a renal artery thrombosis usually following a catheterization other causes includes coarctation of aorta renal artery stenosis congenital renal anomalies and then uh, hypernatremia neuroblastoma etc management includes sodium restriction diuretics antihypertensives like ac inhibitors calcium channel blockers vasodilators hypertensive emergencies can be treated with iv lactone the prognosis of primary hypertension depends on depends upon the level of blood pressure at the time of diagnosis and the age at the time of diagnosis usually pre hypertensive and white coat hypertension has got good prognosis children who has grade 3 and grade 4 retinal changes have got bad prognostic factors associated obesity hyperlipidemia insulin resistance <coughs> these children need careful follow up gradual reduction in medication under supervision is an ideal step down therapy stage 2 hypertension need long term the prognosis of secondary hypertension depends largely upon the underlying cause transient causes like postreptal glomerulonephritis hsp and hvs have good prognosis while coarctation of aorta and other condition depend upon the associated congenital heart disease so the take home message is hypertension in children and newborn is not that uncommon all children 3 years and above a routine blood pressure examination must be done at least once a year it should be a component of pediatric physical examination the effective treatment of childhood hypertension may decrease the risk of coronary heart disease stroke and renal disease in adults overweight and diabetic children should be carefully followed up uh, with bp monitoring non pharmacological ways are useful in mild hypertension single antihypertensive therapy should be started initially and then the dose should be increased gradually and if needed a second drug should be added ac inhibitors and calcium channel blockers are usually preferred thank you